Good afternoon and welcome. Welcome to uh, Hudson Institute. Welcome to this debate about next steps um, for the US strategy in Syria. My name is uh, Jonas Perlo Plesner. I'm a non-resident senior fellow here at uh, Hudson that I've been, um, among other things, working on these topics of um, Syria and stabilization and um, what happens next. So welcome to our audience and welcome to the viewers out there. We have the pleasure of being covered by uh, C-SPAN today. So we know it's not, not just our audience here, but also broader that's uh, part of this. So today's panel, as I said, is on next steps for US strategy in Syria. I have a stellar panel with me up here to uh, talk about that question. Um, I have just here next to me representative for the Syrian uh, Opposition Coalition to the United Nations, Marian Jalabi. You're also equally important, um, a founding member of um, the Syrian women's political movement, something that you're also going to address. Um, I have my colleague, Hudson Institute senior fellow Mike Duran, and um, that leads little introduction, who is a great expert on this and has worked both inside and outside ad, uh, of the administrations of questions in of the Middle East. And then we have um, Georgetown doctoral candidate and former senior policy analyst at the US Commission on International Religious Freedom, Jumana Quadur, that's also joined us. Um, as introduction about sort of the new US um, strategy in Syria, uh, the newly minted US envoy to Syria, Ambassador Jeffrey, recently when he was in New York, laid out US policy to, to Syria with uh, these sort of three elements. First, that the US will remain in Syria until the enduring defeat uh, of ISIS, um, which is sort of something that's been the policy for quite a while. Um, then a sort of real diplomatic push uh, for the implementation of UN Security Council resolution uh, 2254 that covers um, ending the conflict in Syria. Um, and um, then as a third point, he also mentioned sort of the removal of all Iranian commanded forces from the entirety of, of, of Syria. Um, and in a little bit as a sort of fourth but uh, point he mentioned on Idlib, of course, the sort of the U.S. role and how the president has personally engaged to uh, avoid escalation, uh, which um, so far seems to be the case, but uh, is one of the things that we we'll also discuss uh, up here on the panel. So actually to, to kick us off on the question of the sort of new um, U.S. Uh, strategy, Three of us here were assembled back in May on a panel theme that we at that time called Should I Stay or Should I Go with a, the Clash theme song uh, based on that at that time President Trump had said that the US was going to leave quite sh shiftly uh, from Syria, which no longer seems to be the case. But um, I would um, ask uh, my colleague Mike Duran to be the first to sort of assess sort of this new uh, US strategy in, in Syria, how much is new and and how much it is can be implemented quickly, and particularly the element about sort of um, the Iranian uh, forces in the country of um, the U.S. having a, a much more sort of active policy of, of getting them out of there. Mike, uh, why don't you take it from here? Thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, Jonas, and thanks to all of you for coming. Um, I, I think what we see there in Ambassador Jeffrey's um, list of, um, uh, of objectives of the United States is sort of um, the beginning of a, of a strategy. I think there's a kind of strategic thinking behind it. Um, I'll lay out w what that is. Um, but before I do that, I think it's kind of useful to um, go back a little bit and see it kind of historically. The, the Obama administration identified defeating ISIS as the, um, as the number one priority. And in fact, as the only priority, it was sort of counterterrorism, uh, uh, a counterterrorism strategy. And that led to um, several major developments. Uh, one was we entered into a tactical, what was, uh, what was identified at the time as a tactical, temporary, and transactional relationship with the YPG. Uh, which was the most effective fighting force, because we didn't want to put our own troops on the ground. Didn't, uh, President Obama didn't want to repeat what he saw as the mistakes of the uh, war in Iraq. Um, and so we looked for a proxy who would fight ISIS for us and found it in the YPG. That temporary transactional and, uh, uh, and tactical decision 
um, had massive strategic implications in the form of a rupture with, uh, with, with Turkey. Um, uh, the second thing, big development that happened is that the Russians and the Iranians made a major military movement into, uh, into Syria, uh, which the Obama administration pretty much turned a blind eye to. Um, and the third development that we're all aware of, which was the, basically the disintegration of Syria. Um, and uh, so now uh, uh, the, the, the Trump administration has followed the logic of the, of the Obama counterterrorism strategy and pretty much defeated ISIS. There's still some fighting going on in the Deir ez-Zor area. Uh, but ISIS, ISIS is nearly, nearly uh, eliminated, and there's a greater thinking about the, the uh, uh, thinking that should have been going on from the beginning, but uh, didn't uh, about the political uh, order that they want to see in the in in the end, um, and they have identified, pu publicly identified, eliminating Iranian commanded forces on the ground in uh, in Syria. I think there's another sort of unstated goal there, which is a reconciliation with Turkey. Um, uh, and uh, exactly how that's going to happen and exactly how, the tra uh, how that is going to affect the YPG-US relationship is unclear. It's going to be, it's going to be negotiated. Um, uh, the, the other thing which they have stated here is they want constitutional reform in Syria. Again, unclear how that's going to happen, because uh, clearly the, the Iranians, Assad, and the Russians don't want that to happen, uh, uh, don't want that to happen at all. Where I think I see the beginning of a strategy here, and I, I don't think that I necessarily have a lot of hope in it, in it succeeding, but there's a strategic thought here, uh, which is that our presence, we're not fighting the Iranians directly, but our presence there is putting um, is putting pressure on them, especially combined with our uh, with our economic uh, policy, our, our economic warfare, I guess you could say, against the uh, uh, against the Iranians. It's imposing costs on them. Uh, somebody has to pay for all of the Iranian-dominated uh, or Iranian-led forces on the ground in in, in Syria, um, and also the, the there's pressure. I think the administration calculates that this is putting pressure on the Russians. Um, and, and the Russians would like to wrap this up and, 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 and get out. And where I think the strategy is leading here is that it's a Russia-based strategy. The idea is to put pressure on the Russians, uh, uh, it, to bring pressure to bear on the Iranians so that we can come to some kind of agreement, uh, 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 agreement in Syria. I think everyone is aware, though, We've got five different militaries in, in Syria. I mean, other than the Syrian military, we've got the, the Russian, the Iranian, the Turkish, the American, the Israeli. Each military is there fighting its own specific enemy. They're not all fighting. Yeah, they're not working together. They have one enemy that they're one or two enemies that they're going after. Um, uh, and the United States only has about I, I don't know a thousand troops. I'm, I'm guessing. I don't know the exact number. Uh, it, that leads to an awareness in Washington that we cannot dictate, we don't have the force on the ground to dictate, to dictate a specific political outcome. But we, can, but we can channel things down certain dynamics and put pressure on certain, uh, on certain actors. And I think the big hope here is that what's going to happen is that the pressure on the Russians is going to lead to a more cooperative relationship with the, with the Russians. Thanks uh, to Mike Duran for those uh, intro, um, introductory remarks. Mariam uh, Jalabi, I would now turn to you and ask you about the, um, you're in, based in, U uh, in New York, in UN. The whole question of the US as the sort of second part of the strategy has really put new emphasis on the Constitutional Committee, that there should be a, a political a push. This is something when we've followed Syria for a number of years, this is not the first time there's been said now there should be a push for a political solution to the conflict. Um, and there was initially a deadline here, a Halloween deadline of the 31st of uh, October for it. Um, the Syrian envoy, Stefan de Mistura, has sort of, I was always uh, given his reply by resigning by end of November, so that there has to be somebody else to take up that mantle. So um, the question is a little bit, is it mission impossible? And your thoughts uh, from the Syrian opposition as well of of how all these negotiations are proceeding. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, 
I have to put this back in context uh, that the Syrian um, uh, political process has gone through eight official rounds in Geneva, plus a ninth in Vienna, trying to create some kind of a process that could be uh, substantiated on the ground uh, with the different parties uh, involved. This has uh, faced uh, an impasse after an impasse after an impasse because of the uh, regime and the Russians not willing to go in any political process. And they keep putting obstacles, everything that's being presented, every file that's being presented. Um, they're like, no, we can't deal with this. Let's, uh, we need to deal with this other thing. And sometimes they don't come. And maybe for the people who are following what's happening in Geneva, you have seen that it has come to um, no results so far. And um, this is combined with what's happening on the ground. Of course, when you are taking um, um, lead on the ground with the air support from Russia and the troop support from Iran on the ground, there is very little incentive to come to the negotiations when you have a backer like Russia, who is sitting also at the Security Council, blocking every possible uh, resolution that could be taken on Syria, 12 so far from what I recall, uh, 12 resolutions that has been vetoed by Russia. So within this whole context, the Mistura for the last four years has tried hard to um, create some kind of a momentum after resignation of um, Kofi Annan and then Brahimi not being able to proceed too much on the process. And there was this um, process that was created that um, has four components. That is um, uh, getting rid of or addressing the terrorism issue in Syria, addressing a constitutional issue, they called it the baskets, and elections, and the transition, the transitional uh, period or transitional process. So the constitutional process that is now being talked about, and it seems like it has taken the lead in all of the conversations about Syria, is one component of the whole political process that we have been calling for and being involved in. And I do want to reiterate here, the Syrian opposition coalition with its, all its components, all of the people that are involved in it, all of the different parties in it, have come forward always because we do want to go through a political process. For us, any progress in the political process is actually a win for us, a win for people who want to create change in Syria. Therefore, they said, we want to discuss the terrorism file. Yes, we'll discuss terrorism file. We want to discuss constitution. Yes, we will discuss constitution, elections, everything. But one of the things that we are counting on that through the Geneva communique and through the Mistura's emphasis that none of these baskets actually can be addressed and resolved on its own unless all of the baskets are resolved, meaning there cannot be a progress in one area without being progress on all of the areas. So within this realm, since the uh, terrorism question has been put aside for now, um, because that's uh, mostly on the ground and in the hands of the international community, the Geneva process has focused on the uh, Constitutional Committee. And this was, I do have to mention, uh, from a push by Russia. Just like Russia is leading on the ground, it also seems like it's leading in the political process. Because unless Russia agrees into any process, the process is not taking place. Us, us wanting to actually be involved in the process, we said, OK, bring on what, what is it that you want to do about the Constitution. We're ready to participate. We're ready to bring in names. We're ready to go through the process. This became problematic that led to the Suchi conference, if you're familiar with the whole process about what's happened within the Russians trying to take the, the whole um, uh, negotiations um, into um, a different place, and from under the auspices of the UN to go into the Russian territory. Of course, um, the international community with the opposition and the Mistura um, kept the file within under the United Nations, and they went to Sochi. We didn't go as opposition. We're not present there because we did not want to legitimize that process or give the credibility to having a process starting in, in, in Sochi. So what happened is that the United Nations under um, the Secretary General, de Mistura, have agreed to an outcome that was put forward in Sochi that uh, stated that the process actually needs to take place in Geneva. And there will be a selection of 100 and 150 people, 50 people from the opposition, 50 people from the regime, and 50 people that will be selected by the United Nations from civil society groups, from women, from other components, civil um, independence, so that could, the process could start. Uh, we have said yes, the regime gave actually their names, the opposition gave their names, and now we're stuck on the third third because uh, the regime, again, is uh, saying, well, uh, we can't go forward with this. First of all, one of their biggest obstacles is that 
this is a Syrian process. I don't know if you've followed also the trip of Demistura a couple of days ago to, to Damascus, where, um, and uh, during General Assembly a couple of weeks ago, where um, the Foreign Minister of Syria says, this is a Syrian process. This has to take shape inside Syria. This has to be a Syrian-Syrian dialogue that's happening on the ground. And you know the story of Syria. There is no dialogue on the ground. There is only uh, one conversation happening from one side very violently. Um, so um, when, when the process is, is happening, they are saying that uh, this is one of the obstacles, but one of the other obstacles or three other obstacles that they're putting forward is that first they want to have the presidency of the committee. And they want to choose or they have the hand in selecting who the president is for the committee. Second, they want to have the majority. Now with the third third, because it's being selected by different parties, they want to have two thirds majority of the total so that they can have the upper hand. And third, they want also to have um, the decision-making mechanism to be based on consensus. That means they have a veto power on anything. Like, if we could have had consensus, we would not be in the place that we are in now today. And um, this has made it um, somewhat difficult to come to any position also on the Constitution. Um, the Americans have gotten a lot more involved lately and wanted to push for um, a more of a political solution, considering also the developments on the ground. As uh, maybe you know, the attack on Idlib was, was halted. And um, we were hoping that this will be a true push for a political solution forward. So now what's happening is that um, they gave a deadline of 31st, the Halloween deadline, but um, that deadline also shifted in what, was it what we're supposed to accomplish at that deadline. Were we supposed to only select the names? Was it to launch? Was it to have the first meeting? What are the mechanisms that this committee is going to be based on? All of that has been actually vague. So this deadline is there, but we are not exactly sure what that means. And then, then we're given the, the other deadline, which is the departure of Demistura by the end of November. So we need to see what that may, may bring. Is this going to be a push for creating um, a real force to establish the committee so that when he leaves, it is handed over to the next special envoy to carry it on? Or is this a process that's going to just be obstructed continuously by one of the parties, the regime, by not agreeing to the third third and um, be, uh, hit yet another impasse of the, in the talks? One of the suggestions that's coming from our side is that why not start something by having only the two parts? meaning the opposition and the regime. This way, like we have our names, we have our committee, they have their names, they have their committees. So why don't we start there? This is one of the suggestions to take some of the obstacles that have been put forward. Um, and we'll see where it goes from here. Thanks. Just a supplementary a question on that also, because uh, Michael Duran previously mentioned the US cooperation with the SCF, with the YPG. One of also the big things, I think, is with the whole Syrian opposition and, and regime is how are particularly the Kurds also represented in this and something that I would like your your thoughts about as well on, on how that I, I uh, yes, right yes, now and, and going yeah. forward because it's uh, this is where the US also has its its sort of boots on the ground is in, in areas primarily um, controlled by 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 Kurdish and um, but which have not sort of been included in the same way and are in different ways courted uh, by Russians and, of course, opposed by Turkey and um, and has a sort of difficult position in this whole situation. Yes, so yes. I wanted you to explain us all a little bit more about that. I would like to first address when you say the Kurds, the Kurds are not one thing. Right. The Kurds are different groups with different political opinions, different divisions, different groups that have certain or different uh, agendas and policies on the ground. So there is a group, th there is the, um, um, the Kurdish Council that is with us, and they have membership within the opposition. They have seats within the political committee. There are Kurdish representation within the opposition that we are working with, with the United Nations, with all of the meetings, like a part of the opposition coalition. There are the other, the other Kurds, the other part of Kurdish um, policy that exists on the ground that the Americans are working with. There is the, the Kurdish civil society that exists on the ground. There are the Kurdish brigades that exist on the ground that are not necessarily part of either. So when we're talking about the Kurdish question, we need to keep in mind that there is no one thing. So what we are thinking or what we are, what we are doing is that we are part of a Syria, of the bigger territorial um, integrated Syria, where we want everybody to have their equal rights and be participant in this. And we have a communique 
and declaration that states the unity of the Syrian population, the unity of Syrian territory, the, the, that every citizen is equal under the law, and all of this. So anybody who has signed on to this is actually working with them together. So this is, this is the, the position that we have taken. This is how we have worked you know, forward to include in the political process, and they are included in the, political, um, in the constitutional committee, and we're going forward from there. Thank Aside you. from what's happening now in Munbij and like the Turkish-U.S. Uh, relations and how the whole area is not handled there. Which is a big Militarily. question which we'll talk about yeah. later. I um, wanted now to turn to um, Giovanna Correa, our third uh, panelist. I mean, you have extensive experience also in the U.S. Uh, Congress where you, where you work. So I thought it would be interesting to get your perspectives a little bit from how this also with the new U.S. US strategy affects thinking in, in Congress, particularly on the issue of, of sort of um, bringing more U.S. pressure on Iran to leave Syria, but also more, more broadly. Sure. Thank you, Jonas. Um, so briefly on the, in terms of utilizing Congress to achieve some of our goals, um, obviously Congress is very divided on the issue, uh, both in how we want to address ISIS and how we want to address Iran. Um, it's not quite clear yet from the administration if they are willing to expand sort of the use of military force. I think we have about 2,200 troops, Mike, um, in in Syria, mostly in northern Syria. We also have the Tanaf base, obviously, in uh, the southeast. Um, that's been sort of a bulwark. We've at least it's been perceived as sort of one um, place where we can both address. ISIS and address Iran at the same time. It was initially obviously erected to address ISIS and its, its, um, its mandate has sort of been expanded, although it's very small. Um, but neither uh, Ambassador Jim Jeffrey uh, nor Votel have made it absolutely clear that we are going to expand the use of military force. Um, but that they, neither one of them has actually ruled that out uh, either. So that, that, that is, the, in terms of the military um, and, and how much Congress may be willing to allow that to happen, it's still yet to be seen, and no formal proposal has been given to Congress to contemplate. Now, there are several pieces of legislation that I think are important to keep in mind um, in, in order to meet our objectives and the President's objectives. Yesterday, he signed into law uh, the Hezbollah um, sanctions against Hezbollah that are meant to address any um, individuals or companies uh, that are dealing with Hezbollah entities um, trans to, you know, to sort of really get at the heart of their transnational operations. Um, and seeing as how there are elements of Hezbollah in Syria, it's, it's very well known, um, part of that will inevitably have you know, rippling impact on Syria. There's a couple of other, there's two other pieces of legislation that are quite important. Um, the House Resolution 1667, otherwise known as the Caesar Bill or the No Assistance for Assad Act. Um, this has been a bipartisan act. It's been ongoing for quite some time. Um, the House was pushing it. Um, it's, it's really meant to, um, to sanction for up to five years um, any contractor, regardless of what, if it's Russian, Chinese, Iranian, et cetera, that engages in any significant um, financial transaction with the regime. And the, the aim of this is really to cripple the regime or anyone who may be looking to deal with the regime, especially in this period of quote unquote reconstruction or the contemplation of reconstruction. So it's really to deter any of these entities that may be considering that. Um, it, was, it went to Senate, it was modified, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee uh, you know, did, did some modifications and now it's sending it to the Senate to vote on and it'll have to go back to the House. All of this is to say if it's not done within this, um, within this particular uh, time period before Congress uh, is out of session again, it may, it may start all over again. But this is something that the administration has been work, excuse me, Congress has been working on. And like I said, it's a bipartisan effort. So it, hopefully something like this would really get at the heart of addressing any potential reconstruction, at least through, directly through the Assad regime. The other one is the Kinzinger Iran bill. Um, and so the congressmen there, along with, with others in the House, have, have really, under this, would mandate the State Department to do any reporting on any group that destabilizes Iraq. So first, the first was really that the, the goal was, was Iraq here, um, particularly Harakat Hezbollah Nujaba and Asaab Ahl al-Haq, who have both been, I mean, numerous pieces of legislation have been attempted to address these two groups in particular. Um, but recently, an amendment was added by Congressman Joe Wilson from South Carolina um, to also add the Fatimiyun and the Zainabiyun, uh, which are the Afghan and Pakistani um, groups that are fighting alongside Iran in Syria. So it's been expanded and, and it hasn't passed yet, but this is definitely a piece of legislation to keep in mind. 
Um, and they're especially, these guys are especially relevant in Deir Zor where uh, Russia and Iran are doing a lot of the fighting against ISIS. And finally, there's this idea of um, the authorization of you know, uh, use of military force. Now, this is a bit of a contentious issue, especially on the Democrat side, um, after the president used um, his authority to hit the Assad regime twice, the both this April and previous April, after there was verified use of the regime's, uh, you know, using chemical weapons. So um, Senator Tim Kaine um, has been holding up the confirmation of uh, David Schenker uh, into his position as Assistant um, Secretary for Near East Affairs, unfortunately, until there is sufficient explanation of, you know, uh, of this use of force and sort of really trying to put, restrict the president from being able to act um, on his own in the future in the event that Assad decides to use um, chemical weapons or, or anything else, or that we may decide to use our current military there to address Iran, um, you know, uh, in a different capacity. So, yeah. I'll stop there. Yeah, maybe just uh, to add to that, the, 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 the two AUMF authorization to use military forces that are in play are from 203 and 203, uh, which are really addressing sort of Al-Qaeda that have then been ex sure. handed for, for ISIS, and it will, of course, be a little bit of a stretch more if it, Iran somehow exactly. also yes. fitted into that, which is why the legal question of should there either be something new yes. Congress should authorize, which there doesn't seem to be the agreement on, as you were saying as yes. well. And, and that's what Tim Kaine is really going at the heart of. So Yeah. Um, I wanted to, um, there's so much interesting here, but I wanted maybe let's start with, with um, uh, Idlib and sort of the question of uh, a, cat a catastrophe averted but for, for how long and also what this shows about the power play with all these outside powers that are part of this. It's been sort of Russia and Turkey now that's been really in the main seat of, of negotiating this and whether, which I think really matters for all of us, whether we will uh, not see a sort of military incursion and, and a further flow of refugees and, and humanitarian suffering, but also how this will play out in the sort of broader political um, uh, things. I don't know, Mike, that's very much, uh, you're a part of geopolitics. What, what do you think will, um, will uh, come out of Idlib? Well, that's one of the reasons, Idlib is one of the reasons why the administration believes that it's putting, that its posture is putting pressure on the, on the Russians, because the, the Russians and the Iranians were poised to retake Idlib, uh, they want to. They want to retake it. Uh, the, the regime talks about vital Syria, and this is the last part. Uh, it's a, it's sticking in their craw. They really would like to uh, expand the regime's legitimate, the, the regime regime's control over it. It's crucial to them to get the international legitimacy for the regime that they crave, um, and they were poised to move against it. And then two things happen. One is President Trump tweeted. Not just tweeted; it was the, the we signaled in a number of ways, but including a presidential tweet uh, where he said that this would be a uh, a dangerous and reckless escalation, um, and that was combined with moves by the Turks. The Turks moved tanks and troops uh, into the area and signaled to the Russians that they were going to have a fight on their hands with the with the Turks. Um, so both of these are um, uh, both of these are threatening to the uh, to the Russians. The Russians have. Um, successfully exploited uh, in certain ways the, uh, the de deterioration in relations between the United States and Ankara. Uh, they now have, um, they now have uh, a productive relationship in certain areas with the Turks, and the Turks are part of NATO. The creating, uh, creating tensions within NATO is a strategic, um, uh, is a strategic goal of the Russians. Uh, and so uh, the going to war, basically, again, or fighting the, the, the Turks in Idlib um, would endanger all of that. So they're deterred in that respect, and then they're deterred by the fact that the United States could possibly use mil military force uh, um, against them. So what we have there is a stalemate in the, at the moment, and the Russians then negotiating um, with the Turks on some kind of, of, of interim relation, uh, interim uh, uh, um, uh, accommodation. How long that's going to last is, is anybody's questions. I think it's going to depend on a lot of these other questions as well. The, the question of, I think, as the administration sees it, this, when, when Dean Mastora makes his final report, uh, the administration is going to see that as a litmus test for the Russian 
willingness to work with the United States on, an, um, on a constitutional process for, uh, for Syria. If the Russians clearly signal that they're going to continue in, in, the, in the regime, that they're going to continue to obstruct, that will then lead to a number of unspecified consequences by uh, changes in American policy that will have uh, that will have consequences, undesirable consequences for the uh, for the Russians. That's just yet to be specified what that would uh, uh, what that would be. But I think that's the the framework in which they're thinking about Idlib. Mariam, I would, I yes, I would add to yep. that. Um, there's also other issues that are connected to Idlib. One of them is Idlib is the last stronghold for the opposition. Uh, or the or the rebels or people who have been opposing Assad. And uh, when I say this, sometimes there is this dichotomy that's being created in the context of the Syrian uh, discourse where it's seen as if it's the opposition and then the regime, and then you have the international allies. Here, I don't want to forget about the Syrian people, Syrian citizens who came out of in the revolution uh, demanding freedom, justice, and dignity, and demanding for voting for the president that they choose in the parliament that they choose. So what has happened is that when the when the regime uh, took over back um, Huta, Isrunguta, Homs, Halab, uh, and Dara, uh, there is scores of people who have been pushed to the north to Idlib. Like this is a fact that we need to keep in mind. Idlib is not four million people. It's not the three million plus people that the that is portrayed in in the media. This is like more than half of it is actually refugees or internally displaced that are coming to the north. And this is the last hold for them. Of course, a lot of the displaced and there were who have come to Idlib are part of the uh, rebel groups that have been on the ground. Even though there's a lot of the military that has been taken or weapons taken away from them, but this is very crucial because it's the last area where these people are pushed to. Where do they go next? There is no next. The other place they're going to go to is outside Syria. And this is where we have had this international community uh, waking up again to the crisis that might entail by going into war against Idlib or the area where you're going to have a huge catastrophe, humanitarian catastrophe, and a huge refugee problem. And this is, I think, one of the things that also um, has made the international community side by side with Turkey try to find a solution with Russia. And the other a very important thing that I think also has happened is that and the regime, um, yes, has gained maybe back like about 60% of the land, uh, which is another issue that I want to take about. It's like uh, gaining land doesn't mean winning because this is what has been portrayed in the in the in the media um, as like if the amount of land that the regime has uh, declares the amount of control that they have, the legitimacy they have. Uh, but in reality, this is only land territory because even people who have they have taken the land over back from like Ghouta and Dara and Hams and all of those spaces, people still want to have their their rights, their human rights protected, which the regime is not doing. So this is a contentious area where the regime actually tried to, to root up troops to bring to Idlib to fight alongside them against whatever terrorism that they thought and to take back Idlib, they couldn't get the amount of troops that they wanted. Even within the Iranian help, one of the things that they have done, actually, some of the Iranian militias, they dressed them up in um, Syrian military clothes and gave them Syrian military IDs so that they could be fighting next to the, to the regime. But this has not also helped because they did not have the amount of people that they could have had to carry on this attack. So there are all of these different elements that have also played within the, the, the question of Idlib, where the international community had to come together and find a solution that was not based on, um, on military, a military solution, which has now created, which we consider an opportunity for a real push for a political solution. Because if um, this is the crux, this is where it, it actually pushes the, the, the balance to a military solution or to a political solution. And we have seen that it's the military push that has the regime used and Russia and its allies. So what we are seeing now is that there is the international community involvement, specifically with the American involvement, that there is a further push that we need to solve this politically. And we're hoping that this will be actually one of the catalysts that will make the Geneva process start in sincerity again. Um, in the near future. Can I just uh, reinforce uh, something that was just said? Um, it's not clear to me, I'm not a military expert, but it's, it's not clear to me that the regime uh, and its allies have the military capability to do this without chemical weapons. 
discipline. The reason that they've been using chemical weapons in Ghouta and, 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 and elsewhere is because they don't have the forces that can actually take it. They, they need to drive everybody else, uh, everybody uh, out through these weapons. It's not just a, what I'm trying to say is it's not just a weapon of terror. It's actually the weapon of choice, given the kind of forces that they, that they have. And since the, the, the Trump administration seems to have, uh, at least for the time being, has taken that weapon away from them, it does put them in a, in a, in a, in a difficult position where, where you can see the possibility of, of some kind of political negotiation taking place. Again, I, I, I should stress, I have a lot of pessimism about, about all of this. But this is, the, this is why they're thinking in these terms. Mana, do you want to jump in? So I would just add one thing that I think is important. Um, and it's something that we, we can't deny also exists in Idlib. So there is a small contingency of Al-Qaeda that no one has a solution for. Mm -hmm. So we have estimates ranging from 20,000 to 100,000 rebel forces in Idlib. It's not quite clear how many they are. Remember, these are, like Maryam said, rebel groups that they've collected from all over Syria and have basically dumped in Idlib in one location. Um, there's about, according to some estimates, I think the Institute for Study of War said maybe about 10,000 Al-Qaeda fighters, um, only 10% of which they say are hardcore foreign you know, uh, Al-Qaeda members. No one, the United States, Russia, no one has, I mean, what we keep hearing is they need to be physically destroyed. No one has a solution for them quite yet. And another issue is that these groups, uh, Al-Qaeda in particular, but same with Iran and ISIS, they will play the role of spoilers in the coming, in the coming months, especially if there's any kind of traction on the political front. Um, during the UN General Assembly, Zarif was in a meeting with, I think, about 20 people. And it was, it was said to me that he said, um, uh, let me find the, his exact quote. He said that the United, um, the European Union, Turkey, the U.S., and the Syrian opposition seek to, quote, turn a military defeat into a political victory, and Iran will not let that happen. So I think it's, I think it's important. We're seeing even, whether it's from al-Qaeda, we're seeing some sort of one-off resurgence. They're trying to attack the coast. They're going to continue to try to play spoiler on this. Um, same with ISIS, obviously, but, but <laughs> Iran and, and its allies are also going to, but specifically Iran, they, they really fought hard for this on the battlefield. And it's going to be very difficult to get them to agree to many of the terms that, that uh, Maryam and Mike both pointed out. So, That maybe on that question, we could go back to one of the initial questions, which is really the U.S. new policy of saying, can you push Iranian commanded forces? You were saying they fought hard on the ground, so it's different from... Russians that are mostly in the air, that they have actually are uh, Iranian forces on the ground. Is there really a sort of a, a possibility of, of, of pushing um, them out of uh, uh, Syria within the foreseeable future? Well, I, I want to hear what Mike has to say about this. I'll just briefly say that some, some you know, I think once the sanctions go into effect, I think that that might really go to the heart of how Iran has been funding a lot of these operations. Remember, they're gathering, they say, about 32,000. Some estimates are up to 32,000 um, Shia-backed militias from Afghanistan, from Pakistan, from Iraq, from Lebanon, that they've, that they've gathered there, that they're paying for. So I, I think part of that is trying to see if, if once these sanctions go back into effect, if they're, if they're going to be able to debilitate that. But I want to hear what Mike has to say about this. Go ahead, Mike. I, I think it's the weak point. It's the weakest point in the in the nascent uh, American strategy. Uh, the um, it's very striking to me that um, the Americans, in, in first Secretary Tillerson, but then Secretary Pompeo gave a speech in which he had his twelve or thirteen. Um, points in which he uh, laid out uh, points of contention with Iran, and one of them was that we want to see the departure of all Iranian commanded troops from, from, from Syria. The Israelis are saying the same thing. The Israelis are basically in a war in, in Syria with the Iranians. Um, and their red lines, they have uh, several red lines, but they basically add up to the point that, um, that they uh, do not want Syria to become a base for um, an Iranian military base. It's striking to me that we and our Israeli ally, and I think we could add to that our Saudi ally as well, and even the Turks, the Turks are not as directly uh, affected by the Iranians as, uh, as the Israelis are, but the Turks do not like the Iranian presence in Syria. There's no doubt about that whatsoever. Um, and yet we don't have a coordinated strategy 
to, uh, to turn our aspiration, our, our common aspiration, into a, um, into a reality. And I, I, I certainly hope that the sanctions will bite enough so that we see a real change on the ground um, um, uh, uh, among the Iranians. But, but um, we don't have that much time. If President Trump, if, if President Trump um, is defeated in 2020, then we have, I don't know, what is it, 25, 26 months, is that right, until, the, um, uh, until, until that time. And the, clearly the Iranian strategy and the strategy of the Democrats, uh, or, or at least the, pro, the, the, the former Obama elements in the Democratic foreign policy establishment and the European Union is to wait out uh, the Trump administration, and then to go back to the JCPOA and to lift the sanctions on the um, uh, lift the sanctions on on the Iranians. So the the time frame on this potentially, um, in what I would consider personally a worst case scenario, is just uh, 25, 26 months, um, and I don't know that that's enough time to see to see this happen. The only power that really has a military strategy against the Iranians is the Israelis, and that but that is primarily one from the air. So this is how both the Israelis and the, and the White House, I believe, have gotten have have uh, latched on to this Russia strategy of using Russia to put pressure on the Iranians to get the uh, to get the Iranians out. And and Putin, um, and Putin is uh, understands this. And so what he's saying to uh, to Prime Minister Netanyahu is, hey, look, uh, we have common interests in. Uh, in, in Syria, and uh, my interests in Syria are not identical with the Iranians in the long term. In the short term, I have a, I have a shared interest with them in defeating the opposition to the Assad regime, but in the long term, I don't need, I don't need Syria to, to be a, a, an Iranian military base in order to achieve Russian interests. And so work with me, don't do anything precipitous, and, uh, and eventually I'll be able to work with you to, uh, to, to come to an agreement that will be mutually satisfactory. And of course, then he goes to Tehran, and he says to Tehran, oh, don't do anything to really provoke the Israelis, because you know, the priority is getting Assad out. Um, and he comes to us and says something, uh, something similar. And um, the effect of all of that is the gradual rehabilitation of the Assad Regime, which is the which is the primary goal of the of the uh, of the Russians, and when I look at that, I ask myself a simple question: Is if the Assad regime is rehabilitated, if they continue to obstruct on the constitutional things, they continue to take territory, and they're rehabilitated internationally? Once that rehabilitation takes place, how valuable are these Russian commitments to oust the Iranians that we're getting today? To me, it's like the old, uh, you, you know, the old Popeye cartoon, and I'll, I'll glad, Wimpy saying, "I'll gladly pay you on Tuesday." Right? We're gonna we're gonna make concessions to the Russians up front, uh, and which they're gonna pay for pay, pay us uh, back in the long term, and in the long term payback is is I fear, is 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 never gonna come. That leads to uh, listening to Mike, a really good question, which I'll pass on to you, is Russia has made itself part of the problem and the war. Can it in any way be part of the solution? What do you think? Um, Russia is, uh, like, just continuing to the idea that Michael talked about, is that the Russians' interest in Syria is very different from the Iranian interest. The Iranian interest is actually wedded to the regime. The Iran and regime are one one or what is it called two sides of one coin uh, the russian element is a little bit different so but even but the russians is using this as a way for them to keep the regime to keep their interest in the area so what i find um uh, on uh, from the international community or from the us policy uh, the 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 idea that they are unable to separate the regime from uh, Iran is a problematic issue because now when they're talking about oh getting Iran out and rehabilitating Assad like you said it's just not going to work there is no regime without Iran there is no Iran in Syria without this regime so that co combination of the powers on the ground needs to continue in order to keep this this regime intact and that's the only way the Russians have because they have the air power they have I don't know five 
5,000 maybe troops on the ground. They don't have the capacity to actually keep their interests protected on the ground. So when you when we're going to be able to solve this, like the, the Israelis don't mind the Assad regime. Nobody minds actually at this point the Assad regime staying in power because it has served their interests along all I, of these I decades. imagine you do. <laughs> yes, the, like, it's pr protected their, their interests all of these decades. So why, why would it be an issue for them aside from, so what's happening is the conundrum is that you've got Iran that's supporting this regime that they want to keep. So what we need to understand, what I would like to see the leadership of the U.S. to actually taking uh, fr up front now, because they're saying there will be no um, aid going into Syria unless the Iranians leave. I think it should be that there will be no aid going to Syria unless this regime changes, unless we go into a transitional phase where we're trying to create a legitimate government for the Syrian people, where we can deliver aid, where we can start reconstruction. Keeping Assad is keeping Iran. There is no, there is no other option for this, because the minute Iran leaves, Assad falls. Assad is not, they don't want Assad. It's not just the Russians. So, the, I mean, Russians is part of the solution and part of the problem at this point. Could we work with them? Actually, we have, we're willing to work with anybody who is willing to uh, create transition in Syria. And from what I understand, uh, that the opposition actually may be going and visiting um, Moscow very soon to, to talk about Idlib and the continuation, not to make it because the, the, uh, the Russian, Russians keep saying that is a temporary deal in Idlib. Um, that what's happening now in the north is something that could completely erupt and change the, tac the strategies on the um, calculations on the ground. So um, there is an attempt to talk with them and see where how we can keep this uh, holding. I could see, Mike, that you were itching to comment on this here. No, I, I just wanted to add a few more uh, d difficult. I just want to flag something. Um, I always see it in worst case scenario. So I'm not saying that this is necessarily what's going to happen, but there's a there's a um, kind of a contradiction in um, the American approach. This is from the 30,000 foot level, and, and it has to do with our attitude toward Iran uh, and Russia on the one hand, and our attitude toward the Turks. Because we, um, we it, is a, uh, it is a priority now of the administration to, um, to improve relations with the, with the, with the Turks. Uh, and I think the preferred long-term answer uh, for reconciliation with the Turks is a reconstitution of Syria. So that because because why? Because the Turks are afraid that what the United States is doing by uh, by this uh, alliance with the YPG is is building an independent Kurdistan in Syria. So the United States, in the long term, wants to reassure the Turks that it is not doing that. What that means then is that the Kurdish regions have to become part of uh, have have to once again become part of Syria. Now, exactly how that's going to happen is not clear to, to anybody. But that there's a desire then on the part of the of, of, of the United States to see the to see the regime in Damascus, whatever complexion, retake the 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 control in, in some way. If the US just picks up that the, the US also wants to get out of Syria. If it just gets up and picks up picks up and leaves tomorrow then the YPG migrates immediately to the Iranians and the Russians. And Russia becomes the primary interlocutor between Ankara and the, and, and the, and the Syrian Kurds. Uh, and the United States doesn't want to do that. So its answer is, let's make, again, let's make, it doesn't, it doesn't want, what does it, it knows what it doesn't want. It doesn't want an independent Kurdistan, and it knows that it, uh, that it doesn't want the Kurds to be under the, uh, under the Russians. So its answer in its mind is, we want to expand the control of the, of the central state back to those, uh, uh, back to those areas. Uh, at the same time, it wants to fundamentally change the character of the state, which no longer has. There no, it no, it, it, it's now dependent entirely on Iranian on 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 Iranian forces. So it can't have both of these things. It can't. It has to make a decision. The worst case scenario, from my point of view, is it, in the end it says, "Well, you know, what can we do about the Iranians?" And and uh, and we'll 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 get some 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 Russian commitments that aren't worth very much about controlling the Iranians, and we'll tell ourselves that that's a uh, that that's a good thing. Now, um, that's one point. That my second point, very quickly, is just if you'd have asked, just I just think it's interesting. If you'd have asked me a year and a half ago, which actor, Turkey or Israel, 
was going to play its hand better in Syria in terms of getting what it wanted from the Russians and the, uh, and the Iranians and from the United States, I would have said the Israelis for sure. But now it doesn't look like that to me. And I, I don't know that the Israelis believe that. Uh, but we now have the Russians on the, uh, on the Israeli border, and the Israelis are taking, on, on the Golan, and the Israelis are taking the assurances of the Russians that there won't be Iranians there. Um, but I, I, I don't believe, the, as I'm saying, I don't believe those assurances are really very, um, are, are, are really something that you can bank on, and that sooner or later we're going to have Iranians on the, uh, on, the, um, on, on the Golan. The Turks remained on Syrian territory, and they took this position in Idlib, and this has given them much more le leverage over the Russians, in, as we see how this has played out, o o over the Russians and the, um, uh, and the Iranians. So it's, it's quite interesting to me that the, that the player with the stronger, it seems to me, with the stronger diplomatic hand at the moment is the, is the Turks. Of course, if, the Israeli, if we had an Israeli representative sitting here, we would probably say, we have the Israeli Air Force, which is proving very effective in Syria, and that's something that the Russians have to pay very close attention to. Jumana, well, yes, exactly. I just I want to add to. something on the Golan Heights because it was very interesting. Last week, Bibi Netanyahu um, said that you know the Golan will always remain under Israeli sovereignty, and Lavrov responded to him by saying that doing so would be a violation of, you know, announcing that it is part of Israel is would be a violation of the, sec the secu UN Security Council resolution. So uh, it was very interesting to see that sort of tense moment right after, right after this happened. And so I, don't I agree with you that the Israeli-Russian relationship may prove to be, uh, it's not stable for sure. And it, it, it may get worse before it gets any better over the longer term. I wanted us also to, uh, to touch upon post-conflict stabilization reconstruction. And I think maybe as a could kick us off with tomorrow there will be a meeting in, in Istanbul where the Europeans, Merkel, Macron will show up for a meeting organized by the Turks but also with the Russians, which is primarily about Idlib and sort of c continuing how to avoid a sort of humanitarian catastrophe where, of course, um, European leaders are very, very interested and, and concerned, of course, also from a sort of somewhat of a self-interest in the sense that a huge refugee flows into Europe. Uh, has happened to 15, sort of has also destabilized to a large degree European politics and at least become a huge part of, of the European political discussion. So that's that. And of course, I imagine Russia on the other side would be very interested in gaining for the, on behalf of the regime, the legitimacy and saying now is the time that European money should start flowing in to, uh, to reconstruction and so forth. I don't necessarily think that, um, that either Merkel or Macron are that gullible and both sort of know that and have said, uh, particularly in Macron, that that's not what's what, what's going to happen. But still, this is a, an interesting sort of evolution where Russia will be then also playing on another uh, front. And at the same time, there is a legitimate question of, um, at some point, hopefully after a transition, that Syria also needs serious reconstruction. So, um, Mariam, do you, what, what's your 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 take on on this? On the meeting. And on the meeting, yeah. Um, the meeting is very interesting in one respect, that it involves the Russians and the Turks. It's under the auspices of the Turkish government that this is happening. And it does not include the Iranians. So uh, Russia, as we said earlier, Russia's interest in Syria is quite different from the interest of the Iranian regime in, in, um, in the Syrian regime. And the involvement of Merkel and Macron in, in, in these talks is um, actually positive for us because it shows that there may be some kind of a, a breakthrough in, um, in the Russian position where they need the international community's support in order to continue um, their legitimate, um, uh, becoming legitimate, being legitimate actors in the international community. It is very well known um, uh, fact from our side that there cannot, the, the perpetrators themselves who are destroying the country cannot receive any money or any reconstruction to build what they destroyed. There is no accountability to, um, to count on that they're going to rebuild it, first of all, that it's not going to be all stolen. And if even if they rebuild it, they could redestroy it again, because it's not something that they are um, counting on. There is the issue of how much of it will go to the regime areas and how much of it will go to the other areas in the country. The regime is, if his regime is holding about 60, over 60%, and then you've got the other 40%. How is this going to work? 
forward. Um, the EU's position so far has been there will be no reconstruction money going in at no point until a transition starts taking hold. Mm -hmm. And this is what the Russians have um, completely objected and have been calling for reconstruction and specifically actually to reconstruct inside the regime held areas, which are the, re the least destroyed. Uh, one of the areas that's completely destroyed is Raqqa actually. And I like talking about this. It's like we're in the US, it's US policy. It's US that has been responsible for the destruction of Raqqa in fight of ISIS. So there are so many questions that are going to be risen in this, um, in the, in this meeting and we're hoping that it's going to be something positive for the Syrian people where the reiteration that there will be no reconstruction money coming to Syria without a transition taking place will be reiterated from the different allies, Germany, France, and Turkey, to the Russians, and the Russians start working with them on this and changing their, their, their course in, in how they're working with the Iranians in the regime. Could you, let me actually just ask you to elaborate a little bit on that, on, on Raqqa, because that's, I think, for a, a lot of um, people, audience and viewers, the, the fact that there, there is stabilization money going because it's part of the areas that are controlled by the SDF, so outside regime control because it was taken over in part of the, the fight against ISIS. At the same time, it's, as you were saying, really destroyed and just demining, which is still going on, is, 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 is really hard. And there's a difficulty, could you move to further stages when there is no political transition. So it um, be interesting to hear a little bit more about. It's, about very, it's very complicated in Raqqa because Raqqa is, a, is a, now under the, the control or the work with the Americans and the SDF. So it makes it very difficult to, it's not a separate state, it's not an entity that can function outside the whole Syrian territory. And the destruction in it is massive. So there has to be an agreement with the people of Raqqa the people who are not in control right now, the people who are not there now, to come and see and be part of the reconstruction of this part of Syria. And I feel, or like the stance is that there needs to be um, a reconstruction happening. But again, that is part of the general um, plan for Syria, reconstruction plan for Syria, and under um, the, the leadership and the legitimacy of people who, who should be part of the governing party in, in, in Raqqa and actually deciding and how this money should go and how, how it should be distributed. And of course, like having been destroyed not by forces aside from, from the US itself, um, shows you that it is a complicated issue where they actually need to put their, their foot on the ground and say, this is how we need to make it happen and take leadership over not returning any of the money or giving any money for reconstruction unless it's done through the legitimate representatives on the ground. Mike, back to the meeting this weekend. Are you worried that the Europeans will be lured into something by either Russia or the other Turks that are against US interest? Or how do you see this uh, meeting? I'm I'm always worried that the Europeans will be lured into these things. But, uh, but <laughs> that's, the, what, that's the, what I knew. The, that's the, why. Uh, yes, I know. Mm. Uh, but no, the the position they're taking uh, is a, is a healthy one. Uh, but and uh, I don't have much to add to what uh, Miriam said, except that that this is again one of the from the American point of view, um, the Russians are want the three R's: the return of the refugees, the rehabilitation of the regime, and the reconstruction. Uh, they want Europe to pay for all the destruction that they've uh, uh, that they've done, um, and the U.S. wants to hold all of that up until we get some kind of commitment to the Russians on the things that are you know, the things that concern us most: the constitutional question and the um, uh, and and the Iranians and the and the Iranian presence. Um, I think that that should a absolutely be an, an American red line. Um, I, I would personally, I'm not going to get it, but I would like to see us uh, have, uh, say, hold up all funds until we get a regime that uh, a regime that we that we can actually work with, um, and that is not the Assad uh, Assad regime. So we, they're calculating, the United States is calculating that uh, that this is putting pressure on the Russians because the Russians don't have the resources to pay for the reconstruction that they desire. Joanna, I wanted to hear your thoughts and also a little bit maybe longer. Can this work in the sense, is it enough to entice the Russians and Assad really to, to change calculus? Is he not more happy running a, a rump state that isn't reconstructed than actually having to leave and then getting sort of um, cities and houses rebuilt? Um, well, first of all, I don't think there's much we can do to lure Assad to concede his power. I mean, we've everything has been tried 
he is not going to step down even if there's money being held over his head. Um, in terms of the reconstruction, it's important to remember that there's also the World Bank that is part of this conversation. So outside of governments, uh, I mean, they obviously governments do work through the World Bank, but there's, there are separate discussions happening there about, you know, should we give half to the regime to entice them and half to, you know, outside areas, as Mariam was saying. Of course, especially people who've worked on Iraq will tell you, I, I've heard especially from them, the most vocal pushback on this idea that that's exactly how we wasted hundreds of billion dollars in Iraq, by rewarding people who helped fuel these wars, um, trying to lure them in for money, knowing that they were corrupt uh, actors and that they were never going to actually make the kinds of concessions we were looking for over the longer term. Um, it's interesting because in the conversation with the EU, they're so focused on the refugees. The regime does not care about the refugees. It barely even mentions them. I was, I was reading actually a very interesting article this morning that had done a review of the Syrian Arab news agencies uh, like reporting. And they said that the word refugee has only been used seven times in the past, since 2011. Um, they're not really referred to at all. Um, most of the people who fled, Assad is more than happy not to have them return. Um, in the summer, I was speaking to some Lebanese generals who, uh, I won't say who they are, they wanted to remain anonymous, but it was very interesting because they, were, they are being sent into Syria to sort of see so that they can facilitate the return of these Syrian refugees. And uh, not only did they come back saying that even bugs can't live in al ghuta like that's how badly damaged they are, but also, they came back having you know, heard reports from the regime that said anyone who didn't leave legally, in other words, that was not stamped on his way out, cannot enter Syria in the, you know, later on. And so the regime is, is doing all it can to also stop this. There was also Law 10 that was only recently removed off the books. Uh, this was the law that the Assad regime initially said would give a month for refugees or people outside of the country to come back and register their property. There was a lot of pushback. They expanded it to a year. And then this past week, um, the Russians actually informed everyone that that's going to be removed off the books, that the Syrian regime is no longer going to mandate it. But what we heard is that the Russians basically told the Syrian regime, you don't need this law to actually do what you want to do inside of Syria. And so you can still take the property of those who have left the country. You just don't need anything that legally says this. There's also another interesting law. It's um, the, I think it's this, uh, it's a nationality law that's actually been on the books since 1969 that's rarely invoked. But it basically um, says that anyone who leaves to foreign lands, any Syrian who lives in foreign lands for more than three years without a justifiable reason um, can have his uh, nationality revoked. So this is something that people are saying can definitely be sort of conjured up by the Syrian regime. Um, because they really, I'm, demographics are very much in their favor. And not just, I mean, there's been a lot of talk at the commission. I worked a lot on sectarian demographics. Definitely the majority of those who rebelled were, they happened to be from Sunni Arab communities because those were largely the sideline marginalized communities in Syria before. Um, but that being said, now it's, it's very much also along class and loyalty lines. That is how Assad is going to define moving forward, who is allowed to return back to Syria and who is not allowed to go back to Syria, leaving most of the refugees that initially fled um, outside of, of this definition. And so what Europe is seeking to achieve will likely not happen um, if the Assad regime has anything to say about it and if Russia does not force it to actually comply with these terms, which I, I don't know how they're going. There's, there's definitely going to be tension on this issue. That's a, can I just, that, that is a great point, but the Russians will dangle before the Europeans the yeah. possibility in order to, in order to get the, fl the money flowing. No, that's, that's definitely that's the case, were. and there will also be, as we see in some European uh, cases, that there are some that evaluate it more positively than the Lebanese generals you mentioned, and saying, oh, conditions are more or less okay now, I think you, you can return, um, because it's, of course, also a sort of domestic um, hot potato in, in many uh, European countries. I well, have can, I, can I just say one thing? One thing that isn't mentioned is that the amount of disease and other kinds of health issues that, are, that have already arisen, but that, how, I, that will arise also from the rubble, from like, the fact that many of these kids are not vaccinated. I, so, so the situation that we're sending these refugees back to, if we were to ever send them, is, is also, I, I mean, it's going to be a different kind. It might not be a violent massacre in the way we've seen, but it, 
it will be very inhumane on a very different level. I, may I ask, yeah, yeah. can I ask what your, um, I'm curious to know what your preferred solution to that would be, or at least interim solution to that would be? I mean, I, I, unfortunately, I think that there's not going to be a way to do this safely if the Assad regime has anything to say about it, uh, returning these refugees. There's no way you can guarantee them, even if we give them the opportunity to vote and express their opinions, et cetera. There's, there's still a security state. It's the, most, uh, it's the most dominant part of the Syrian government. And, and, and allowing these refugees to go back there, the Assad regime's security apparatus is not, unless that is addressed, which is completely intertwined with Assad's fate, the security of the refugees cannot be guaranteed. Uh, leave aside all of the other, you know, like I said, the inhumane situation we're sending them back to. So would you like the international community to compensate the Turks and the Jordanians and the Lebanese and so on? What, what do you have a... To keep, them, to keep them there? Yeah, I definitely am not advocating for their return. That is not willing. I mean, there, there are some families we have from the Jordanians, maybe 100 families a day or what have you, that are returning, very, you know, trickling back. These are not people who were fundamentally against Assad necessarily, um, but there are a very small number of the, remember, like seven million people that are outside of the Syrian borders that have left only since 2000. Sorry, I'd love to bring you in here. How much is this part of the discussions in, in the sort of political process of that the re refugees should come back and be part of a new political life in, in Syria after transition? This is part of the discussions that we are also doing actually about the Constitutional Committee and within also the elections, the whole political process that's taking place uh, in regards to Syria, is that if you were going to have any kind of a legitimate transition, any legitimate political process, you need to have all Syrian people involved in a referendum, in elections, and that needs a neutral and safe environment. Is there any kind of a safe and neutral environment existent for these people? People are afraid, even in refugee camps in Jordan and in refugee status, or they're not even acknowledged as refugees in Lebanon. And it's the worst, actually, place for the refugees right now being in Lebanon. So it is amusing to see that the generals who went to you know, Damascus and came back to think that it's actually really bad, because their situation in Lebanon is pretty bad. They don't have bombs falling over their heads, but... But it's it's very very devastating and very poor, and the uh, the the Lebanese uh, government has not signed on the refugee convention, so they don't get um, the kind of provisions and the kind of help and the kind of uh, rights that they get in other parts of the world. So having to conduct any kind of a referendum, having to conduct any kind of elections within these communities is going to be very difficult mm -hmm. without creating some kind of a safe space. And that safe space, in order for it to be legitimate and well, it has to be in Syria, it has to be through a transition. And even if you're outside, to not be fearing for your life, because Syrians are still fearing for their lives outside Syria, that they're going to be attacked or they're going to be um, security, Syrian security will come after them. Now they're so busy inside Syria, but there has been this assassination outside the Syrian um, territory has been happening. Mm. So it is very difficult for the people to go back. And this is one of our biggest concerns in trying to get any of the legitimate process going as um, in, in, in the political process. Thanks, Mariam. I, as moderator, have the privilege of asking you all these interesting questions. I have more, but I also want to start bringing in the audience now. So simple rules apply, as always. State your name, affiliation, if any. Try to make it a question, not a long monologue, because then you could have been on the panel instead. So um, <laughs> and uh, with that, let me uh, start here. Oh, yeah, wait for the microphone to come, and then, then name, affiliation, and uh, a question, please. Uh, hi, my name's Garan Özcan, and I'm the representative of the People's Democratic Party here to the US uh, from Turkey. Uh, and I want to thank the panel firstly for their remarks. Uh, I just had a question for Maryam Jabali about, uh, when asked about the Kurds, uh, the initial response was that the Kurds are not one. Um, at, you know, they're divided and they're different opinions, which is true, uh, but which is also true of the Syrian opposition, uh, and which in any way does not delegitimize their concerns in Syria, and it shouldn't for the Kurds either. Um, and actually, in fact, the Kurds have proven to be um, much more internally coherent, uh, both politically and militarily in Syria. So uh, I wanna, my question would be then, without specifying the coherence or the unity of the Kurds, what would the Syrian oppositions, um, what, what do they propose to the Kurds in a future Syria 
uh, they have uh, legitimate concerns in Syria. What would you, as the Syrian opposition, say differently to what has happened in Syria before? What would your uh, project for the Kurds be in Syria? Do you want me to answer that? Or yes. Or you want to go to questions? Um, thank you for bringing that up. Yes, the opposition and Syrian people. And when you're talking about any people, you have a lot of different policies and different opinions and different agendas, and sometimes actually influenced by outside forces also, because we as um, a group of people, we always have our affiliations and allies from the outside and the inside. So the way we see Syria, or the way I, I joined or I signed on to a group to work with, is the integrity of the Syrian territory that we are part of one country. Yes, and I agree with all of the arguments I do get sometimes is that this is actually a, a created state. It's not even a, this is a Sykes-Picot agreement state where you see like the lines of the borders in Syria are actually some of them pretty quite straight. You know, when you're going to Jordan, it's quite straight. It's a deal that was made by the colonial powers in creating this kind of a Syrian structure. But this is what exists. And we have created a Syrian nationality that, um, it says Arabic, I would like to see that removed because Syria is very diverse. Syria has a lot of different groups, a lot of different religions, a lot of different ethnicities, and it's intertwined because Kurds and maybe, I mean, Sunnis and some other religions, but you've got then the Arab Sunnis, then you've got the Armenians, you've got the Druze, and you've got the Alawites, and you've got Circassians, you've got a lot of different groups that are intermingled. So the, the uh, call in the future is to have an equal citizenship for everyone, and also rights uh, to the people, to any people who exist inside Syria to have their rights preserved. I know there are Kurds, over half a million Kurds, that citizenship has then been taken away. Kurds have been moved from, this is en masse by the Syrian regime, like moved from an area to another area where they could be mixed within you know, the Arabs so that they are spreading them out so that they would not have a, a specific Kurdish area or a majority in any one spot in Syria. So there are these issues that have existed for a long time in, in the Syrian context, which needs to be addressed. And this cannot be addressed unless we all sit down together as Syrian people. Once the killing stops in Syria, once the bombardment of the people stops in Syria, that we come together when we're doing solutions for Syria, when we're going through a transition where there will be given, you know, representative from the different Kurdish parts, the representatives from the different uh, Sunni parts. Um, one example that I want to bring in now is that I am part of the, um, the founding, one of the founding members of the Syrian women political movement. And really loosely, we're saying the Syrian women's political movement because we, we felt that Syrian women's rights have not been addressed by the, the, the bigger opposition, the general opposition. And Syrian women are 50% of the population that their specific needs and concerns and specific ways of knowing and dealing with the legality and the reconstruction of Syria and the constitutional building of Syria needs to be addressed. So when we came together, there is a wide range of, of affiliations that we have. And that's why it's called movement, because there is a common denominator that we have, that we have agreed on. And we look at each other, and we know I have very good friends you know, from the movement, and we're working together. In the future of Syria, we're going to be part of different parties. We're going to be calling for uh, the nuances, the changes in the legality that we want to create. What is it specifically, how we want to be addressed specifically? There is the Sharia law that comes in, the security, what kind of, what kind of a governance system that we want, the centralization, um, the decentralization. There are so many issues that's going to come to governance that is going to relate to also what kind of a citizenship that we're going to have that are issues we need to discuss. Can I put that right now at the table and discuss it? It could be, but it's very difficult in the state that we are living in now. So what I call for all of the different Kurdish groups or parties that we're working with <coughs> is for us to come together to a common denominator, which is we want to keep the land, the Syrian land, one land for now, and that we're going to um, work to give an equal citizenship, equal rights according to all of the different components that the Syrian um, the Syrian population, the Syrian, the Syrian citizenship uh, can, can have. And that is actually something that has been used in a lot of different countries, like you can see that in Switzerland, you can see it in, in Canada, you can see it in different places, where a specificity of a certain group of people 
inside a country can be accommodated. So I see, I mean, I aspire to something like that, but this cannot happen unless we sit down and discuss it and see how we can, how we can come to, to terms in how they'll be represented in parliament, in government, on the ground, what are the rights that they need to have, and um, <coughs> so, that, so that they are, they are enriching the, the, the Syrian you know, culture and, um, and existence. And I come from the north, by the way, and my dad is from Qamishli, and my mom is from the south, from, from the Golan Heights, so I'm half, half, you know, between the two parts. And I would like to see, you know, Syria from Qamishli to the Golan Heights, yeah, in, in state, in, in, um, in one um, um, territory, one country. Over here. I'm uh, Peter Humphrey. I'm an intelligence analyst and a former diplomat. I hate strategic surprise. And I'm wondering what happens uh, the day after al-Assad gets the heart attack he so richly deserves. What happens the next day? And um, if I may, the, uh, the prospect of him remaining in power, um, and we get stuck with that, um, can we make that contingent on him releasing <laughs> or 12,000 prisoners and let that be a deal breaker for us? And let's take one question here in the front as well. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Sida Mohammed, representative of Syrian Democratic Council to United States. I would like to uh, thank you uh, for your, I mean, informations. Just I want to ask uh, Mr. Joe uh, Mariam. Uh, I think recently you heard about the coalition they visited Africa, just uh, maybe two years, two days ago. They went there to empower the Council of Afrin there. Do you think is it a legitimate a, a council to be there? Whereas the, the, the people of Afrin now, they are in the camps outside Afrin. And do you think about, <coughs> what do you think about the violation which is happening in Afrin, ethnic cleansing, demography changing, and even torturing the people in order to force them to leave their area? This is one question. Another one, I mean, you are asking, talking about the Constitution. And now the Constitution is going to maybe, they are preparing for it and for the third group of the Mr. Demistora. But still, there is a large, I mean, area in the northeast of Syria is not included in this group. So what do you think about this? Do you agree that all the Syrian people should be included, representative, in order to have a you know, can say fair or a good constitution, till now they are not invited. And I would like to ask Mr. Mike about something, I mean, he's telling about the strategy of, of the U.S. What, what do you think is the strategy will be for the U.S. to have the balance between the relation with the Turkey and even the moral commitment for the SDF, which they pay a lot of prices with their thousands of people being died by liberating the areas of Raqqa, the resort from the ISIS and the terrorists. Thank you so much. Thanks. Mike, why don't we start with you? Uh, okay, in, in answer to the first question, uh, uh, I expect that the, 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 the um, Russians and the Iranians will get together and find somebody from when the, within the Assad system to take his place. Take his place. Uh, it's such a family-based system uh, that um, I think to go outside of it um, is um, is dangerous. Um, and I, I don't know that we. I, I'm, I had never thought about what we should do in that in that uh, in that situation. Um, with respect to the um, the SDF, well, we're, we're in a dilemma now uh, because uh, um, and our system is quite. Divided, I would say the um, the military on the ground is very committed to the allies that they have worked with because they because they have fought and they did defeat uh, did did defeat ISIS. Um, but at the political level, you know, at the, in in Washington, there's a great concern about the, there's an awareness that uh, Turkey is not going to go away, uh, that it has vital interests there, it has a long border, and it's going to influence this uh, process. So. They're, they're groping toward finding a, a middle ground. And the, the, I think the answer of the administration is the Manbij process. So that the Manbij, we have the joint patrols now, and the, uh, creating a kind of local governance. And then I think the dream is uh, that we'll move uh, the Manbij process um, 
will apply it all across the um, all across the Syrian uh, Turkish frontier. Whether we'll get to that or not is is anyone's guess. But that's the I think that's the approach they're going to take. Miriam. Um, the Afrin question. I am I am with you. I um, I have friends from the area. Uh, part of the Syrian Women Political Movement is actually one of our members. Is um, keeps ringing up the issue. Uh, there are gross violations. There is uh, a removing and forced displacement of people. And not only that, one of the things that I know that's happening in Afrin, there are some of the people that are coming from the south are being re-stabilized or resettled in, in, in Afrin, in like their houses, people who are out in the camps, and their houses are being given for people who are coming. Yeah, see, like, so what's happening in Syria, what I want to go back to, and I don't want to sound like an idealist, or I don't want to sound that I don't want to address, like, the issues specifically, but what I want to say is that the, the state we are living in now, where um, the, the violations are um, conducted with impunity, and where a lot of these brigades, a lot of these rebel groups that are on the ground have don't have an actual control over them. There is so much that is um, that is coming from actually a lot of um, individual violations or groups violations without without the um, necessarily the the blessing uh, or the systematic uh, violations that the regime is creating. And this is because of the nature of the chaotic state that has happened in Syria, northern Syria right now. And um, we have been working with the Turkish government in trying to create, I, I work with, with a friend who has um, an organization called Do Dodari. I don't know if you're familiar with it, with Sabiha Khalil. We're working with her in trying to find ways in how to address this issue in a way that is most uh, service to the people, to the civilians. And I want to go back to the issue that civilians are the least um, the, considered when it comes to these issues. Like the violations against the civilians are, are not looked at when we're looking at, at Syria. What we're talking about is actually the military power. And this is one of the things that I want to go back to and also talk is that in Syria, we don't talk about human rights. We don't talk about violations. We don't talk about international law. We talk about who has land, who has more power, who has more military, who has more fighters. And this kind of a discourse for Syria needs to change from a discourse of power and and who has the military power on the ground to a discourse of human rights. Who is practicing human rights? Who is violating human rights? It has to go to a discourse of international law. And this cannot happen unless we have a true transition that is taking place in Syria. And this is what brings me to the next question to the Constitutional Committee. In the Constitutional Committee, there are Kurds that are, when, when I say Kurds, I always feel like it's not adequate enough because there isn't, if we have a Tur few Kurdish people with us, it doesn't mean it's representing a lot of the, the, the Syrians. The same way I feel also, they say, oh, we have two, three women within, you know, the, the opposition. I, I, I do have to say this, within the 50 names that was given to the to Demistura to represent the, the Constitutional Committee, it was only 8% women. Women represent 50% of society, and we got 8% of that Constitution. So definitely the, the, the representation is not going to be accurate. It's going to be skewed about how many representatives are on the ground. But this is a work in progress. And this is what we need to talk about always. And this is what we need to bring forward and make sure that all representatives of Syria or all of the voices in Syria are included so that we can have, we can keep our territory, we can create a more democratic and um, adherent to human rights um, state in the future. Jumana, do you want to? jump in here, it would also be sort of concluding words as well. Sure, I, then I'll just, I wanted to address the gentleman's question about if, if Assad released 12,000 prisoners, would we be okay with letting him stay in power? Or would they, should the international community be okay? First of all, I think it's much more than 12,000. I'm hearing estimates more, I mean, much, the number from what I understand is much higher. Um, I hear... Sure. I mean, but there's, I mean, there's people who the regime doesn't even acknowledge, right, are still within, um, it's uh, confined with the regime. But in any case, I, I, I don't think that that's sufficient. Um, I think the detainee issue is one portfolio of many. Um, and I think what, what maybe we're losing sight of is how weak the state will be under Assad going forward. It's already only strong enough because of his, the heavy involvement of his Russian and Iranian allies. It is not in our, even our U.S. national interest to allow a state like that to continue to go on indefinitely because um, we already, as I mentioned before, Al-Qaeda is already a problem. It is, it, there, it's, it is resurging in different parts 
of, of the country, and it's going to continue to play a spoiler. ISIS, they said right now, it's currently, although it's lost territory, that it's as powerful as Al-Qaeda was in 2006, Iraq. That's what I, I, I was reading. Uh, the Institute for Study of War, War had a piece very recently on this. So although, like Maryam is saying, maybe territories are changing, things are from the outside superficially looking like they've changed, the bad actors are still very much there. And I mean, as an American looking at this also from a national security perspective, it's absolutely not in our interest to just let this kind of go on and fester. As said, you know, he may, he may, him and his allies may go after ISIS when it is in his interest, when they're in the desert in the middle of nowhere. If they're not doing anything to him, they're not necessarily going to put all the resources there to get them. So I just, I don't think that that is, um, that aside from the fact that the Syrian people, like Maryam is saying, at the end of this, you have the Syrian people who, who they are the ones who need to be OK with a man who has killed, they say, in upwards of a million people and has displaced 12 million remaining as their president. I mean, that's, that's something that question goes back to the Syrian people to decide. So. Thanks, Yamana. Um, I could see there were more demand for, for questions, but uh, we're running out of time, so I, I want to um, together thank our panelists. I also wanted us to end, I mean, we've covered a lot, but I think actually what uh, Mariam was underlining of saying, going back to 211, where this was a peaceful demonstration that demonstrated for a different Syria, that even though this is all now ended in the 21st century's biggest proxy war, at the same time, there is, this is happening. I mean, the Syrian society, is irrevocably changing, and there are civil society in completely different ways, as you have described, uh, through what you're also doing with uh, the women's movement. So I think that's also I think, important for all of us to, uh, to take away from this, apart from the, the destruction and the war that's still going on, um, that uh, something is also, a new Syria is also emerging one way or the other. So Can I, I add one, one comment about that, like yes. the Syrian, <laughs> Syrian civil society? It, I always use the sample as that. I'm not exactly if my numbers are pretty very accurate, but um, it's close. Uh, uh, that there was about 700 civil society groups that were registered in Syria uh, before uh, the revolution. And I want you to, that in comparison, I want you to compare it like in, in Egypt, Syria is 23 million, um, Egypt is 80 million, but the uh, civil society organizations that were registered in uh, Egypt at the time of the revolution were 30,000. And we had 700 in Syria. And most of their, those were under the auspices of the regime, and most of them were run by the first lady herself. A lot of the ones that had to do with uh, women issues and youth and uh, um, all of the new nice ideas that she thought she was bringing. So since then, since the revolution has started, there has been over 2,500 2, civil society groups that have sprung up in Syria. And these groups are, this is when I'm talking about that the whole dichotomy that's created between like there's opposition and there's regime and people are forgetting the people you know, who are there who have came out in the streets in demonstrating, asking for their rights and demanding to choose their own president. These are the people who are taking care of all of the elderly, all of the sick on the ground, the ones who are actually continuing the education of children, even though we do still have, I do need to give that number in, that there are about three million children that are at the age of schooling in Syria that are not going to school. Any, the, the civil society is the one who's, any good work is being done on the ground, they are the ones who are doing it. And these are people we need to count on. These are people who have a lot of amazing experience that they're accumulating now and have kept the social fabric of society intact and they're working with them, whether it's in the diaspora, in the, in the, in the refugee camps outside or inside Syria, inside, in spite of the bombs, in spite of the killing, in spite of the deterioration of all of the different aspects of the social society or the social structures that have existed in Syria. So I would like to point to that as a hopeful note that people in Syria are resilient and they keep on going. And uh, no matter, no long how this uh, fight for us to get our freedom and democracy is going to take, um, that they still exist and they're still out there. And I count on, on, on them to, to make it all um, a reality in the, in the future soon, hopefully. Thanks a lot, Miriam. Thanks to the whole panel. I hope uh, you'll all join me in thanking uh, the panel. Thank you. Thank you.